this is a this is a very much a work in progress not least because i can't get word to work and so i had to like literally just spend my lunch break uh taking notes and throwing them in and um because what is with the word anyway um but i'll go through and and uh my points are all, all in here and so that's fine um but i but uh chris thank you so much for just a wonderful two days um i got a lot out of this uh, you've already done yeoman's work uh, for bringing us out of the state of nature in our contemporary academia into a, a fully obligated and contractual and almost free uh, sense of ourselves uh, through your series on, on YouTube and the other work you've been doing. It is um, too many of us feel in academia as if we are in a state of nature without any institutions and we have to create them ourselves from uh, willy nilly. And um, and and I, it, it just I've gotten so much out of uh, of your work personally, uh, but also the work that you've helped to uh, sort of provide a platform, literally a, a platform, a YouTube platform for um, just a number of great talks. Uh, and so th th thanks for this. I really appreciate it. Um, so I have one epi uh, epigram, um, which is uh, from um, uh, 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 Hayek's, uh, the uh, the political uh, economist, uh, Hayek's student, uh, who was an e uh, international economic lawyer, uh, Ernst Ulrich uh, Petersman, who uh, is famously said, uh, the common starting point of the neoliberal economic theory is the insight that in any well-functioning market economy, the invisible hand of market competition must by necessity be complemented by the visible hand of the law, right? So we, we wed the Hobbesian sovereign uh, uh, to uh, Adam Smith. So there's a general schematic that I'm gonna be going through and presuming, which is something like this. In the 18th century, we have sort of like economy within a state of nature, right? So we have scholasticism, we have the Renaissance. And then if you look at any of the writings of the mercantilists, certainly the physiocrats, uh, and then certainly in Adam Smith, these are economy is not yet separate. The big story, of course, of the last millennia is economy is nothing. And now it's everything. And then just chart from there, right? And so in, in this period, Right, where it's taken over the political, right? Um, in this period of the 18th century, it is continuous with nature, which makes sense, right? If you uh, if economy is attached as in the physiocrats to agrarian uh, property, is if it's attached to the production of the seasons and so on, then you are going to think of, of it quite in that way. Uh, and then Smith speaks about this. It's also that they're borrowing, uh, and this is a a uh, 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 hat tip to Stephanie uh, about metaphor. Uh, the metaphor is all physics, right? And they were wanting specifically, and this has been the dream of uh, economics for, for two centuries, to give us a physics, right? To give us determinations of the movements of capital in the same way that physics determines the movement of um, the motion of, of, of whatever it is that Thomas talks about in five volumes, right? So um, that stuff. Right. Um, and so we move, we have a sort of state of nature in that period, but a state of nature where economy is not yet external. Now in Hobbes, I'll grant you money is a convention, right? In Locke, it's back in the state of nature. Uh, so there is some movement back and forth, there, but, but in terms of the description of how economics works, it's not yet independent of nature, right? Then we get the uh, in, hyper individualism, right? So it, economics is then for in the classical economy, that this goes from Smith to Marx, continuous with nature, even in Marx to some extent, deterministic history, right? Then you have the uh, marginalist revolution. And here uh, it becomes a, a methodological individualism and a utilitarianism, right? So if you've read Bentham, you don't need to read further, that's the marginalist, right? Just given like a lot more numbers, right? And so with the marginalists, you get this sort of internalization and denaturalization of, of economy. This is the secularization, secularization of economy, right? Is in the late uh, 19th century. Now that is everything because economics largely hasn't changed since then. We're just rewriting it, giving many more numbers, but we haven't changed because we get neoclassical economics over the last 40, 50 years, which is, uh, which is basically just hearkening back to that. Um, but what interests me in this paper, if I ever get to it, is simply this is crypto and arbitrage and the new kind of financialization of the market, which is presaged, I admit, in Milton Friedman's work on speculation, is that a break from this neoclassical consensus, which has given us neoliberalism. 
in other words, it's worse. So, uh, so we'll start. Okay. And if, if there's repetition, do tell me because that might've, I had a fear that I was cutting my notes twice. So in modern life, there are any number of sentences that when heard portend no good. Worse, even in such phrases as I had a crazy dream last night. I think this might be my masterpiece. Or I've got this idea for a state of nature conference in the US is the phrase I've gotten into crypto. You know, you're in for about a few hours of conversation that you don't want to have. So paying homage to Allen Ginsberg, the beat poet who is often found in Columbia's environs, each of us wants to cry out like Ginsberg's howl. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving for their fix of the latest crypto news, speaking a foreign language of insane sound and verbiage, blockchains, cryptosis, altcoins, flippening, and so on. And we would mean this somewhat literally. We know some of the most advanced doctoral students in physics and math are being ingested into the hedge funds to work on this stuff. But we're all also all likely have some personal experience with a friend lost to the crypto world. A friend and co-editor for a book I worked for some years with uh, turned from Heidegger to crypto, and I literally have not heard from him since. He, uh, update, he's a professor in a business school, so he got a job, so you can get a job in philosophy if you do this. Another, whom for years I wrote recommendations for jobs for, now is a social media feed dedicated less to his takes on the news and happenings um, in his life, then the stock then looks like a stock ticker you can see on the bottom of the screen on financial news stations. Worse might be friends taken uh, who were once um, taken to anarchist thought, who now spout the libertarian possibilities of non-fiat currencies. That's the worst brand. You have your gradations. Worst is your is an anarchist friend you were once at protest with, who's now gotten into crypto. That is the longest. That's going to take you out days and. Good luck finding a cult, a deculturizer or whatever you want to call it. So don't worry, I have no intention of trying to get you to invest in my new digital currency and a slate of NFTs I'm introducing to the market just in time for the holiday shopping season. In thinking about this conference, I was trying to think through the relevance of the state of nature today. I fulfill my social contract. As you know, post rawlsian liberalism posits endless reconstructions of the original position and states of nature are thought to be something of a political version of pre-Kantian dogmatic metaphysics. Now, I think states of nature and political naturalism are doing much work in contemporary uh, political politics and economics, as some of you have suggested uh, rightly. And I also recognize that anthropology as traditionally practiced, and as is often uh, continues to be practiced, amounts to nothing other than tracing the human origins in order to say something wider about what the political has and ought to be, has been and ought to be. But I'm less interested in that continued updating of early humanoid figures in biology, archaeology, evolutionary psychology, and anthropology than the sites of quasi-states of nature today. To borrow Chris's language uh, yesterday, while one might argue um, um, <laughs> argue that uh, po post-contract, these are not true uh, states of nature. I would say that they are figures, uh, to use uh, Chris's terminology, right? And they are pervasive across our landscape. So maybe one of them is the pandemic. Uh, there's childhood uh, in all its forms across all our geographies, right? A state of nature uh, that is sort of an age. Uh, we have uh, the prison yard, uh, the object found in laboratories, the wild, whatever that means, within and beyond our supposed encultured sites, Black urban spaces in racist depictions, the school gym locker room, and perhaps you have your own examples of states of nature. Uh, maybe that was my own locker room experience. For me, I was working how these, how I was trying to think through how models used in contemporary economics, especially as Freeman talks about in his 1953 essay, are they a state of nature? That is a sort of a priori uh, uh, figuring that we play with in order to then deduce economics. In the end, no. And I'm going to get to hopefully why. Um, so this is a paper of failure because I was going to make that case and I, I realized that's, that's wrong. So at least, economics, at least in its rhetoric, is always naturalizing its movements, its physics. I'm thinking of the economic under neoliberalism, which is in many denunciations uh, said to be extrinsic to the political and operating by forces uh, leaving us without obligations uh, and lives that are nasty, and giving us lives that are nasty, brutish, and short. I'll say more in a bit. For a moment, 
let's not laugh too much at the fraud, fraudulent messianism of the crypto scene that you've all heard of at, at some point, but take it seriously uh, in terms of what they're trying to say about a non-fiat, non-central, or non-social contractual uh, currencies. The advent of Bitcoin and the broader cryptocurrency movement is, it said, a paradigmatic shift in the understanding and functioning of money, a rupture in the continuum of monetary history. Please take this all sarcastically. I'm not advertising. The shift can be likened to a monumental discoveries in other fields, such as girdles, transcendental arithmetic, or the invention of asymmetric cryptography. These are two examples a crypto site gives. Um, they signify a fundamental transformation, a paradigm shift, a splitting of, a, of history into a before and after, in a fashion exactly like the three figures Chris discussed yesterday. We have homogenization of the previous era, which you dupes still believe in, a splitting, that is, between the era of the dupes and those enlightened few who are on crypto, and then, of course, a set of norms, live like this, not like this. Traditionally, monetary theory has been deeply rooted in the representation of property from Plato to Locke and beyond, a concept entangled with the physical and the tangible. We can see this how strong the gold standard, still presumed by Australians and Americans, I mean, check Canadians, uh, but I did check, uh, to be at the basis of our country's dollar. So if you ask people, they think we're still on a gold standard, that Fort Knox, that's why money is valuable, right? So this notion of money is contractual, relying on notions of credibility and trust. Great job, Chris, putting the two trust papers together. Mm -hmm. By contrast, Bitcoin uh, and similar cryptocurrencies introduce uh, a model, supposedly, where credibility is produced, not consumed, right? We don't, I don't need to trust you because it's all, uh, because it's within the blockchain and it's already been, you've already been, that's not even a question. Right. So unlike traditional currencies where trust is centralized in financial institutions and governments and where threats to that trust are a threat to currency itself, cryptocurrencies operate on a trustless system. In short, it seems like Friedrich Hayek's dream announced almost uh, 80 years ago, uh, namely a currency that is completely removed from governmental authority. Crypto would be a currency not beholden to the classic age old theory, uh, state theory of currency. Nor that is the view that all currency uh, is ultimately has to be uh, guaranteed by state or by a sovereign. Uh, nor is it linked by uh, to an extrinsic value that is labor, objects, or anything. In fact, as an investment, crypto is the signifier and the signified. Its ontology is Deleuzian flows, not substantiation. You could find Deleuzianism all over. Not real Deleuze. Don't write any letters. Not that anybody writes letters. Taken to its end, crypto is not tethered at all to what we philosophers might quaintly call reality. You would at some point exchange crypto, uh, might exchange in some fantasy, uh, crypto dollars or coins or tokens for elements um, or something exterior to the blockchain system. But in reality, once crypto has become ubiquitous, as they claim will happen, we would finally do away with Marx's MCM model, money, commodity, money, and not have mediation or whatever's mediated, neither money on one side and commodity on the other, but rather currency as the activist, as an active currenting or flowing of an imminent system. You exchange crypto in the end for crypto. Value is wholly relational. There's no transcendental signified, as Derrida would call it, no reference as Frege would. To use the language of finance, pure liquidity, it would be quizzical. But the point would be that in, in Marx's model, right? Remember it's money, commodity, money, right? And so commodities, and they become the mediator, not money is, right? So you don't have two people exchanging on the outside, exchanging money, but as if crypto, their version is, in some sense, there's only just these flows. And so the only value is that continuing relation going on. And so everything, think of NFTs. They were thinking of producing everything like that. So in other words, every thing gets attached to the blockchain in terms of numbers, your cup of coffee, everything, right? And and so in other words, it's always on the, so it's always producing it in sort of, it's always imminent to that system, right? So you don't have a reality external to it. I'll try to think that through. That's a question for later, but thanks for the question. So I got to work on that part. Okay, so schematically, but I think there is a dream of like a pure financialization of the world. Just take it that way. 
schematically and, simple, and, and again, we're engaging it like sort of a fantasy or phantasm, not that it's realizable or whatever. Schematically and simplistically, we can offer the broad outline of the invention of economy and its aftermath. In the beginning, there was no economy and there were no economists. Some might think we're good days. Recall for the scholastics, there was always an intrinsic or monetary price in exchanges, and hence usury, making money on money, was a sin since it misunderstands money's intrinsic, intrinsically representational deference. In the long period we call modernity, I didn't go back to the uh, Indo-Europeans, that's for another day, but in the long period we call modernity, we see the rise of something called economics. That was at first thought to be a particular part or aspects of nature in the 19th century to its ultimate denaturalization today. For Hobbes, prices are convention, but materialist that he was, he spends a lot of time on the weights and measures of given metals for their value. Hobbes argues that money is conventional, paradigmatic of a common agreement within societies. But more broadly, from mercantilism through Hume to Adam Smith, markets were studied uh, through and in the metaphors borrowed from natural philosophy, that is, physics. It, is at one, it was at one with nature. Carl Linnaeus once viewed the ultimate goal of economics, and when he used the word, as the cultivation of exotic plants like tea and cinnamon, seeing this as the pinnacle of wealth. He believed that humanity would eventually recreate the Garden of Eden's prosperity and uh, give us leisure. This early uh, modern view of wealth is shared by Locke, by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, I say that tepidly, I'll wait for our annual conference that's going to come out of this one because we're clearly forming a Rousseau Society here, and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, this was deeply rooted in a sort of pre-lapsarian, before the fall of man, ideas uh, and differed significantly from later notions of wealth, which focus on maximizing utility. So during the late 18th and 19th centuries, economic theory evolved, evolved to recognize the economy as a separate entity governed by human-made laws and actions rather than natural processes. Until the mid-19th century, economic phenomena were seen as part of the natural world, akin to uh, the way that uh, the subjects we study in natural philosophy. Economic discussions were intertwined um, with uh, physics, uh, and uh, parallels were constantly drawn between natural processes and uh, economics. Now, obviously, that rhetoric is held over today, especially in the political sphere, but it doesn't mean it is a rhetoric used within the textbooks of economics, right? So economic texts of the 18th century, by contrast, downplayed the role of the individual insofar as economic phenomena, money, and markets uh, were joined at physical nature. They were governed by laws that operated uh, at, a, at a grander level, at a wider level. It was usually as a member of group, uh, say as merchants or farmers, or later in Marx, as a class that economic relations transpired. Indeed, the material conditions of economic modes of production, hunting, farming, were strongly determinative of individual traits, not the other way around. So as you know, the, the story of the last 150 years in e economics is always to found the macro in the micro, that's actually the phrase, right? To take these more global movements and always get back to the individual. Right. That's why they're constantly reusing the invisible hand because it's, it's one guy getting something from the baker and Adam Smith, but Adam Smith meant it as a, that totally taken out of context in Smith, but it really does become the paradigm later on. So the transition of economic thought from being uh, intertwined there, um, so if we compare, sorry, the views of leading economic theorists from, say, the 1770s to those, those a century later, we can see some key uh, clear differences. In both era, there was a belief that economic elements like money and trade were orderly and subject to certain rules, yet the understanding changes significantly. John Stuart Mill serves as a pivotal, pivotal figure in the evolution of economic thought. It is, to use the word of the conference, the ideology of capitalism. Initially, Adam Smith defined political economy as a science of the legislator, focusing more on governance than on economic phenomena themselves. It wasn't until the first half of the 19th century that the concept of economy as an independent entity emerged. Mill played a crucial role in highlighting human agency as central to economic analyses. In his introduction to the principles of political economy, Mill states that economic conditions de uh, are dependent on physical knowledge and they fall under the purview of the physical, sorry, physical knowledge falls under the purview of physical sciences. However, moral or psychological causes which happens uh, with economics, uh, belong to the moral and social sciences, including political economy. 
Mill's work marks the shift of political economy from a focus on the physical world to the social domain. Now, in a lot of ways, this is presaged by Bentham. If you've ever read Bentham's work on the law, you see all over the place how uh, that comes out of his utilitarianism. You could, you could, it, it looks very precious, very much like utility, utility, uh, utility maximization works of uh, the last century. So, to a significant degree, after Mill, late Victorian economists repositioned their concept of the economy such that. Um, all social institutions were man-made through and through, and they did mean men. To put it most emphatically, the economy went from being a natural entity to being a social one. This did, however, uh, did not diminish their quest for a scientific understanding of it. If anything, it suggested that they could manipulate it and create the conditions that they were studying. One of the apparent gains of denaturalizing the economic order is that the economy is no longer something beyond our control. Our conviction in the existence of an economic order is no longer predicated on the, no, on the laws of a natural order extrinsic to our power. So neoclassical economics views economic laws as arising from the new, unique calculations and preferences of different individuals, including their attitudes towards risk and time. Right. So this, if you've ever taken Eco 101, this is it, right? The first three chapters are all... Um, uh, all, all of that is already in, in Marshall and other figures of the 1870s, 1880s. With a multitude of variables and a wide range of preferences, each person is distinct, making it rare for groups to feature anywhere in these theoretical analyses of the, of the late 19th century up until today. The diversity in mental attributes, our different beliefs, our desires, well, that's just being part of, of somebody else to market to. And it's what drives the existence of pat and patterns of economic activities. So this uniqueness extends to the point where no two individuals define or measure their utility in the same way, right? We all have our different, that's how you're different. Like I get pleasure different ways, right? Uh, the complexity and uniqueness of each mind makes it impossible to compare utility, right? So money is currently perceived now, comes to be perceived as a key um, indicator of current and then future, oh wow, that's a transition. That's just, whew. Uh, so I'm now I'm going to try to go back to currency. And what I'm trying to mark is there's the neoclassical view that then focuses on utility maximization in the individual, right? And then uh, how is money getting treated, this, the medium of exchange? So capital comes to start to be represented in the way that um, Heidegger describes futurity. Uh, every, it, there's only a future relation to money, right? There is no past relationship. You're always considering money in terms of the stake because as an investor, you're looking to the future, not the past. Otherwise, you're not investing. And Chris will talk about that retirement soon. So uh, in other words, capital in essence, we represent a stake in the future defined by the concept of time discounting, right? So in other words, uh, Keynes, one of his great insights uh, in his uh, work, which is contested, but, um, but not enough to actually upend this order is um, that, we always want liquidity. We always want money in our pockets. And you want money quicker than you would later. And so we always demand, the, the way to say this is, uh, if um, if I'm buying a bond and the uh, the bond doesn't come up for another six years, I'm going to get far more money for that, more, more in interest payments than I would uh, if it was a week, right? We demand more for how long our money is taken away, right? There's opportunity costs. In other words, it becomes a future relation, not production from the past, but the future, right? Uh, good. So this brings in Milton Friedman, right? Who, uh, following him, open, uh, home, uh, sorry, uh, for critics, homo economicus is someone who is eminently, I think, for him, governable. It's not a libertarian model. From being, um, so from being, uh, the notion of laissez-faire begins, changes drastically from the, uh, the, the uh, neoclassical period. In other words, it becomes what Foucault calls a correlate of governmentality, which um, acts on the environment and systematically modifies the variables. What I'm saying is essentially, is once we've gotten rid of nature, Friedman's insight is in, in 1953, he famously argues, our economic models don't have to be right. They do not have to relate to reality. There's not a nature. I'm not describe. So he's like, what are you talking? So when, you, when, when critics go, people aren't really rational like economists say. They don't care because Freeman argued 70 years ago that we don't need to care because it's a model. He says uh, uh, in particular there that this is, a, this is a speculative, economics is speculative. In other words, what proves me right is the future. 
which means far before uh, uh, limited ink in the late 1970s, this is a model of performativity. I will create the conditions for that, right, will have been um, <laughs> my science, right? So the concept of economy is severed from nature, also lends itself, uh, as I said, to human control. Uh, we can look at uh, 70s and 80s works, blah, blah, blah. So this brings us back to crypto. The financialization of society has been um, on the back of our alliance of, of our economies on private banks, as you know. So unlike the government, private banks, when they invest with each loan, they are increasing the money supply. Why? They now owe you money, and now they've also put it there. So now money is now in two different places. That happens every time there's an investment. And the paradigmatic investment of our age, as we know from the crash in 2007, 2008, uh, is prior to crypto, the derivative, which, as you know, it's a derivative, so it, it's a it's a necessary supplement to use Derrida, but it's a, um, I don't know, it's a bet basically on another investment. Um, but there's, I think this is right. There was far more money in derivatives than in actual aligned derivatives. Like, so in other words, I can buy, I can have an investment in Chris's career retirement, right? And how well it'll go. And then I can sell each of you derivatives betting on how well that retirement goes. That was why we, we went, that's why we went completely in 2007, but we, we put in some backstop to that, but we didn't solve this problem because too much money was to be made. So as such, the derivative, so, and the paradigmatic investment of age prior to crypto is the derivative, which is a promissory instrument, a contract that is based on the, this is what I was trying to think through, this whole logic, on the promises about the future, a contract that is based on the promises about the future, and this gets to a certain indecidability between the fraud, uh, fraudulence and, um, and truth, because what's happening is when you have uh, buy a derivative, you're anticipating the latter's unpredictability, you're trying to uh, get at the unknowns, but it requires that contracts are not fulfilled because you're betting a, for failure often, right? That's, that's what shorts are. As such, the derivative foregrounds, rather than life's radical contingencies, rather it breaks out of probabilistic thinking altogether and brings us to just pure contingency, right? Uh, speculation then can be understood as the very act of endorsing a failed promise, or put another way, the act of knowingly entering into a broken contract. Um, um, yeah, in other words, you're buying a repudiation. Speculation then can be understood as, uh, that's the ex same exact thing, uh, much like speculating on the degree of volatility um, prices, political speculation now centers not on whether a promise will be kept or broken, but on the distance between the promise made and the promises likely for swearing, right? So when we vote now, I was thinking of how this model works too. Like we go vote for Biden and we're like, or whoever you're gonna vote for. And oh gosh, you can tell I teach in Louisiana or whoever you're gonna vote for. <laughs> okay, can't say, can't say, you, know, you gotta be, yeah. So um, that you, you're you sort of already modeling out um, that the, the promises are gonna be broken. We all know that, right? Like. They, they over promise and they know it, you know, it's all the, all the commercials. He's not going to save social security. He's not going to end social security, whatever. Um, and so it's like working out like, well, how much am I betting on? Right. So, um, so here then perform it. So it becomes, in other words, these, uh, the, when we go back to economics, it becomes non-representational. We have Friedman's dream of having an economics whose model was without any relation to nature. Once we get to crypto, it is non uh, here then performativity, which has had the salutary political effects when we're analyzing how power and language are productive has become the dream or fantasy as a purified performativity um, in the in the form of the temporality of the it will have been the case of the fake it until you make it society of the con as countless books and documentaries on netflix attest we can no longer distinguish between the contractual and the fraudulent we are speculators each of us uh, and stabilization, stabilization economically is always death. The future is the test. And so those companies with the most value are not those that have sold the most goods or services and are not doing so in the present, but those who can persuade others that they will have been the most productive. So too with each academic on the job market. Chris actually said something like this yesterday. We don't need to speculate on the present uh, that this uh, notion of the future has brought us. Uh, we are living it. Thank you.
I, 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 I think it's very interesting. I it's very hard to follow, but yeah, I, but um, but I think it's very important and also um, so if I just think correctly, I'm telling you. So I think one of you're pointing out that one of the problem of crypto when we can use the past development of uh, economics is that it's speculative. It's yes, it's pure speculation, right? right? So in other words, the value you're so somebody's literally just digitally producing money. Uh -uh. And it's worth nothing until I get others to sign on to it. Mm -hmm. So there is a moment of trust. That's that's the first that's the first part. But mm -hmm. once everybody signed onto it, um, it's, there's a reason why the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission has it. They are going to though. They are being forced by the courts to hasn't approved the market in crypto directly. Mm -hmm. Is because it, it, they're all they almost always blow up, right? That said, but everybody, why are the 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 largest hedge funds on Wall Street? They're all have major crypto, mm -hmm. and they they all say. Quite explicitly, we're hoping to be on the way up, mm -hmm. right? And so, once you realize that move, then you realize how hedge funds usually make their money. It's always being on the way up, mm -hmm. and it's everybody else who's always on the way down. They are always socializing their losses. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's, so I, I think you're... so. Crypto is like getting rid of the. It's pure, like it puts the so any claim. So if you ever learn anything about investing, they sit you down. It is not again, right? Like. Do never mistake these two. Like the worst thing you could ever say to like some financial whatever, what's it, or economist is like, well, that's just gambling. They're like, oh, fool, you are so cynical. I mean, you rude. That is the best view. Like the more you study, the more you like, they know they're gambling, right? Except with major hedge funds, because of the amount of money involved, they they usually acquire much the knowledge much more quickly. They have the computerization that makes their trades much more faster. A lot of the money is made just by like many millions of a fraction of a second trades that sort of thing which obviously none of us are doing well, yes so again i i think that that's a very accurate um description of what actually happening but i guess um like there are different aspects of cryptocurrency so if you talk about uh bitcoin you know it was developing after 2008 um mm -hmm. the the derivative of uh, the a subprime mortgage problem, right? Mm -hmm. And the core idea was that, you know, since government is printing money excessively, we want to have this stable. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's quite different from the speculation that you're describing. I mean, I, I get it. That's what actually people are doing. But if you go back to the, the Bitcoin, the, the, I mean, I think it was the, quite the opposite. Um, the, the goal is, I mean, you can say it's a scam. I, I totally agree with that. But the, my point is, I think there are different aspects and, and I wasn't fully convinced that you know it was a full speculation. Um, what else is it on the value of Bitcoin? What else are you? What are you? So so in, in, so when when one invests, so to be very simplistic, so, right? So you're doing one of two things, uh -huh. right? What I'm looking at the value uh -huh. of the holding, uh -huh. and you're looking or at the previous market, which means mm -hmm. you're looking, you're speculating. Yes, that's speculation. So it can't be the property that's attached. Uh -huh. What's it attached to? You're betting on its future price going up. Uh -huh. Why else would you buy it? So, so what you could I'm, say is a hedge against the U.S. dollar. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So but then, where are people putting? But go on. So what I what I want to say is, I, I think the idea was um the idea was that yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the practice. I get yeah, yeah, I get yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the original 2008 yeah. paper. Right? Yes, uh, the the idea is you don't increase the qual quantity of the Bitcoin itself, so that you know it made the, the well the value increases value to... up until what 23 billion crypto coins, right? Yeah, yeah, either 23 million. Yeah. I'm off by like a fact. Yes. Yeah. So like... what I'm saying is whether that is right or true. I think it's like a whole different argument that the, the proponents of uh, cryptocurrency and I think there are many scam. Uh, uh, currency as well, but when it comes to Bitcoin, I think that that's the idea. Um, it's just what I wanted to say. Yeah. Um. So, no, it's a really good question, especially since mm -hmm. I mean it's a theory practice problem, mm -hmm. right? So theoretically, um, yes, I know what the people are saying, just like I know what Milton Friedman says. Mm -hmm. But what is how is it enacted, right? Yeah. And Bitcoin is nothing other than a speculative market, mm -hmm. right? Anybody who's in um right the 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 value of crypto last year what went down by 70 mm percent -hmm. bitcoin went down by half ftx then, went down okay right then is gold somehow like, tether is, is gold speculative net market as well yes but it's i am i'm not under i'm not a, i don't believe that there's some value out there mm -hmm. i actually i'm with marx marx says that values and uh, that um uh, value is produced through money through the production of money, okay. it's not like there's no. Okay. I see it. Right? Yeah. And crypto. Okay. That's what you're saying. Yeah. But it's like some. But this is like the how. Like they took that as an instruction. Like, well, let's let's get complete liquidity that isn't tied. It's 
So it's completely fungible. Like real estate is non liquid, right? Because you have to like then transfer and like it's sold. Crypto is like immediate, right? I just mm -hmm. give you my digits. There we go. But I don't even have to worry about going to the bank first or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I get the the theory, mm -hmm. but also what does that become, right? Like every they all they all say this for all the versions of crypto, right? Mm -hmm. Ether, right? Yeah, yeah. Tether. They, they've even been to ones that are tethered to the price of a dollar, mm -hmm. which is the most embarrassing. How tether is not collapsed? Um, yeah. But it's a good question, but you clearly have a digital wallet. No, no, I don't. Actually. You don't? Okay. I, I personally You're think like, well, Bitcoin alone. I personally think it's a Ponzi scheme. It's the worst thing. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Because as you know, the worst thing you could do if you own any, there's also like a mutually short destruction problem, which is that anybody who holds Bitcoin can't say anything negative about it because the problem is it's all built on that. Mm -hmm. We're all in on the fraud, but if we start talking about it as a fraud, people won't invest. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and the value collapses. I was just trying to that the best yeah argument. that's really good you got a great <laughs> question i love that question. uh what what does this have to do with the state of nature of the social contract again <laughs> right um, <laughs> uh no that's that's um if i didn't come back to it okay so did you start it, with it yeah uh, so in, in the beginning, right? So what I was, what I said was in the 18th century, right? Exchange and, and money were thought to be part of nature. They were not post-social contract, right? Money in Hobbes, yes, is post-social contract, but bartering and exchange for them was part of the social contract, was part of the, was within the state of nature and was one with nature. They, they thought of this as a natural prop of something that occurs with the seasons and natural thicket farming economies, right? With industrialization and capitalism, by the late 19th century, you have the marginalists. And this is, um, so Foucault in his Birth of Biopolitics talks quite a bit about how neoliberalism, as opposed to liberalism, that's the 18th century version, right? Um, sees ec economics as, pro as produced. We need governance to some sort of set up this, this chessboard under which, right? And if we're not there, it doesn't happen. Right, um, and he's he's right in this sense, but it happens earlier. It already happens with uh, Marshall and, and uh, all of, uh, all of the uh, economists of the of the marginalist revolution after Marx. And so uh, the the way that what I was trying to think through is, at least in theory, crypto would be a return to in some sense to a state of nature. Why? It's not contractual. Who are you contracting with? It's it's algorithmic, right? There's no trust. Right, there's no reciprocity, so it, it's an attempt. So it would be a fantasy of like of that, you know, the neoliberal economics. Like, let's just be in the state of nature. That's wonderful. Like, let's have no governance. Let's have no authority. Let's now have no centralization. That's why the anarchists love it. Some the the, the ones that have fallen away, right? That's why they, they they love that model because it get it's 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 where that weird uh, libertarian right meets with some people sometimes uh, activists on the left. So that was my that was that, but what I found was it still required. It, it's, it's. I'm still. It's an open question for me whether it, it produces a state of nature. It certainly has the figure of it, the figuration, mm -hmm. um, and it's certainly a dream. But it comes out of an economic set of uh, priorities, beliefs, models, practices that see economics as um, fully produced, right? Um, yeah. So does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. What, what did your paper have to do with this conference? <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to that. Yeah, you got me back to that. Wrong <laughs> <laughs> memory, that one. See. <laughs> um, no, so, thank you. Yeah. I actually do have a question about the sort of contracts that you're discussing um, in the paper. And so I was just actually wondering this is kind of a big question, but about how the nature of contracts themselves might be posited in like the crypto world or the world of like shorts and things like this because i was wondering a contract as i am conceiving it now it's just i will do x uh in return for y so it's mm -hmm. like fixed outcomes that are um like expected and can be sort of tr trusted that will result so i was wondering if you if it's possible for contracts to be created with an uncertain outcome um, because of the nature of um, like how to agree to that. And then in terms of shorts uh, has another a different sort of question about whether it is even possible to make a contract 
on the, on, a, on a knowing failure of a different contract because that would be as I would imagine it in the state of nature trying to make a contract with a lying party it wouldn't be a valid contract um so that's just kind of some vague yeah questions. yeah it's it's why I didn't say lying I, I said something like a promise that yeah. fails right um because I'm still working that out that's a very very good question I really like that um and so what was the first part it was um was the first part it was oh yeah it was um whether um a contract can be created with uncertainty. Got it. Thank you. Um, so, so in a, so the way we normally think about contracts, right, is that we have an exchange, right? Something has to be given, right? So there has to be something, and there has to be a mutual promise, right? So it's not a gift; something has to come back. There has to be reciprocity. Now, it doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be fair. God, gosh knows it doesn't have to be. I don't want to say gosh. I'm still in Louisiana. Uh, gosh knows it has to be fair, right? Um, uh, but with crypto, there is none of that. There's no because. Uh, uh, well, the way we think about contracts is, is in the way they're portrayed is, is the original social contract would then be that mutual trust that be, then guarantees each individual contract because now we've created a sovereign that can enforce the contract, right? So when you go buy a house and you show up at the house at that day and you find another family is living there, you cry for all, you, you go to the police if you want to do that, um, go get your AK-47 if you're living in the Midwest, right? Whatever you do, um, you, you, there's there's some guarantor for that contract right outside some external party but the point of crypto is that i don't have to trust you because the the database the spreadsheet that you could just find each of the numbers is publicly available it's all transparent and so i know whether you have it i get it immediately so there's none of this in fact it's previous contracts that required the threat of force for enforcement i don't have there's none of that there's no trust there's, that whole model is gone so it's not a contractual relation at all um yeah, I'll leave it at that. But I, I get what you mean by it's speculating, but there's no promise made either, right? It's a so I was trying to think through the relation of when as an investment, it is a speculating because it's always future, it's a, it's where the prices will go in the future rather than the value it presents now. Um but it seems to like really take that model to the the absolute extreme. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks. Right. Um Stephanie, please. Ah, okay. So um, I guess something uh, you had said, and then you, you kind of backtracked a little bit, but but it, it worried me. Um, in terms of crypto as pure liquidity, and no external reality, as completely cut off from a reality, um, kind of this extreme form of denaturalized economy at the same time that it's a kind of state of nature. And I guess I'm thinking a little bit about the problem of economics. And, and <laughs> as infinite growth on, an, on a finite planet. So I'm really interested in the problem of how we're propagating this idea that my students do this all the time. They're like, oh, the cloud, it doesn't exist. And I'm like, no, it actually has um, a physical entity attached to it. It uses up a lot of energy. Uh, you can track the natural resources. So maybe, I, I guess part of me feels like I don't want to subscribe to the idea of crypto as being kind of no external reality because even in terms of all this discussion of speculation, I mean, this, we live on a planet that's undergoing climate change. So kind of at some point, reality, I mean, this is the whole Anthropocene discourse, right? That it, it comes it comes rushing back in at us. And so I guess I would like to hear just a little, I mean, do you worry about the fact that kind of you use terms like once we got rid of nature, right? And I, I'm like, to be what? Absolutely what? crystal clear to be as, um, God, I see my big head over there. Um, to be absolutely crystal clear, I am what I'm what I'm attempting to do is to take the rhetoric seriously and see what is attempting to say about its own role economically. That said, as I as I said at the end, it's a it's in it's not I mean, we don't have to speculate. It's in the present. It's a disaster, and crypto itself is a huge pollution problem. It's a huge carbon producer. I think like what uh, just. Um, Crypto in Russia produces every day more than like all the electricity used in Texas, right? Like just these, because at Bitcoin, right? As uh, as they're running out, like and more and more people, as the value has gone up, there are more and more companies trying to produce the, you have to do some random processing, but whatever, it takes a lot of computer power and they have to have like these giant industry sized uh, computer um, uh, networks running these problems that produce, all, that take in a lot of electricity and so on. So no, there's a lot of dangerous externalities that are produced but I was trying to think through what what is their fantasy? What do they want, right? What is, what is it answering for them? Does that make sense? Like, 
what if currency is if crypto is not just a fraud if it from the beginning mm -hmm. um if it's not what what fantasy is it ending right because when our students get into it right or you you hear about it from others or whatever it's clearly answering something for them one of them is is a complete uh, loss of trust right oh well which is so bizarre it's like wow we can't trust the american dollar but we can trust this bozo who 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 sells me like ugly monkeys uh, as NFTs, right? Like, right? But that's the, that's exactly the rhetoric. And so I'm just trying to understand the logic of the and and the fantasy, um, but not affirming it as my view of how the world should be uh, at all, at all. This is not a liberatory project. In fact, it's it's the reverse. And um, Flora has a question. Yes, and it's not about Rousseau. Um, and, um, <laughs> it's not a what? Rousseau. Oh, <laughs> not about Rousseau. But I, I hope I can um, listen to your answer entirely because my landlord is supposed to arrive in a few minutes, but I'll still um, ask my question. Um, I really liked your analysis of crypto, but I'm wondering if um, the, um, the use of credit and credit scores how did that pave the way to crypto and to what extent a lot of what you said about this fantasy of creating a currency with no external reference to what extent can that be traced back to um credit scores credit scores you said credit scores right credit scores yeah yeah that's really that's a really good question right because another way that we're producing currency is debt, right? I mean, that's the infinite, like we're just producing more and more credit, right? And so of course, like there's obviously a gendered and racial aspects to, uh, and class aspects to how gender, uh, how gender scores are done. How, well, that's probably out there too. Yes, and I'm so puzzled by the way, you know, I, I think I finally understood the basics of the system of the American credit scores, but I'm really puzzled by the, oh, you know more than we do. And the criteria that are used to, assess credit so yeah i mean it, it's interesting because uh well maybe we could think of this as a common project among all of us here at the end uh maybe, but, but it's not a state of nature but we should all be thinking about our credit scores um is um it's speculative right like a credit score is speculative so it's it's supposedly tied to your past right and how many did you always pay your rent on time did you do whatever right and it, it is like the more than anything else in your life it'll affect everything right like not your job particular job Right, it's that metric, right? Whether you're at whatever level you are, right? And so, but it's speculative in the sense of like it's telling some authority, uh, the car dealer, the, the the house dealer, the crypto financier, like how how much you can pay back, right? Um, what's interesting though is that they're move the stock market is moving more and more, like when they're uh, crowdsourced real estate, REIT, real estate investment, uh, what trusts, which don't need trust. Um, they're moving towards models that don't require credit scores, like even a link to the past. What will matter more is uh, how much you can invest at the time and um, how much is being purchased and put into the system. Um, but so I'm wondering how, if, there, if there's a dream in crypto to even get rid of that, right? Because it's, because it's completely off, it's not on that model. But I am thinking like it does produce debt. I don't know, I have to think about that. I don't know. What do you think? Because you oh, may not know about credit scores than we do. Like, what's it, what, you know, it's the fault. No, uh, it's I, another I, algorithm. Because I think, I'm not sure it actually, it's, um, I'm not sure, you know, um, credit scores are um, a purely virtual currency the way crypto is. But I think it somehow paved the way to it in the sense of presenting us, you know, this magic number that comes out of, you know, criteria that, you know, the, the, the users, you know, no one asked me if I agreed to be judged to be assessed on these standards. And so one thing that I'm sure of is that credit scores are a way to, to completely break from the social contract, at, at least as I intended. It's certainly, it's a way to build a society on a form of contract that has nothing to do with the, with the you know, rational understanding uh, that, um, that we're used to.
No, that's really good because like that uh, that that gives me a whole idea for a chapter, right? Is to look at the history. I mean, obviously, it has to. I, be, I hope I will get credit for that. <laughs> you will. You'll get you'll get that footnote near the end, right? Like that's that's gonna like worth all your effort there. Um, yeah, you'll be remunerated, right? Like in that, you know, we always look for an exchange here. Uh, but one one certainly one way we can look at it is if you one of the things that you can chart certainly is in the 1870s, 1880s, and then absolutely after Keynes after the Second World War. There was a mathematization of economics, as you know, right? And so obviously this has to do with what can be computerized, right? What can be put into our computers, what can be modeled, right? Which means it also had to do, um, this is interesting, just like kind of philosophy, uh, analytic philosophy may have been produced in part by the uh, McCarthyism, um, that is don't do Marx, but economics too gotten very mathematical in the very moment that you didn't want to be talking about justice and so on too out loud. So you put it everything in terms of mathematical models, right? So there was a consensus, uh, a, a sort of quasi Keynesian mathematical consensus, how much is actually Keynesian after the Second World War in America and UK, uh, uh, the ISLM model um, that took over economics departments at, and then monitors and took, so, took over and it, it's been dominant ever since. But these are very mathematically inclined metric. So in other words, everything, whereas previously, Humanities people could read economic textbooks and come away, and, and actually everyday people could. Um, now it's a specialty; it has its experts, and they have their models, and they're like sort of the the, the old, uh, you know, they're the priests who come down and tell you what the models have told you is the right thing to be done. Uh, so norms are productive, and cer and certainly part of that is that quantification of each one of us down to a credit score, um, right? Your entire life and your ability to pay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it certainly belongs to that period. It's an index of that period. I don't know if I have much more to say, but it definitely is worth looking at. Because because one thing I didn't talk about is the production of debt, right? Which is itself another financial financial instrument. You, nobody here, if you have a mortgage or you have any loan, your the company will borrow from it. It probably doesn't own it at this point, right? That it's it's been resold and resold, and then somebody's betting on whether you're going to repay it and like it's been sold again, and that derivative has been resold. Or to be for some of you, including me, uh, your student loan has been resold like sixteen times. Yeah, right. And I, I've just got one one final question. We're going to have to wrap up in a, in a minute, aren't we? Um, I'm so I'm I'm going to put forward an idea. I'm not sure whether it's your idea or or not. I'm not sure whether like you it. will agree. If it sounds smart, then it's not. Like um, but I'm taking issue with something you said, and I I can't quite work out whether you said it in your own voice or not. Um, so. It is always trust, all the way down. You cannot get out of trust because if someone says to you, there is no trust in this system, and you say, okay, you're trusting them, that there's no trust involved in the system. Like I don't, not, no one in the room here, I would suspect, understands um, cryptocurrency to the extent that we can say, I am absolutely sure that there is no conceivable situation in which any trust would be required in this system, because every system is bulletproof until it isn't. Every system is safe until until it isn't. You know, and, and there have been there been systems in the past where people have said, you know, the Titanic was unsinkable until it sank. You know, who knows whether in the future some incredible AI or quantum computer or whatever it is will find a loophole in the cryptocurrency system that no one can remotely conceive at the moment and that would, would seem laughable to people at the moment. And so there's, you can't you can't get out of the circle of trust. That you, you always hit a bedrock of trust eventually. Oh. And so <laughs> and, and so the, the, the only choice you've got is between the trust that realizes it's a trust and the trust that pretends it isn't a trust. And the, the second one of those is incredibly dangerous. It because is. because it can't it it doesn't understand what it is and it can't reflexively deal with itself and so if it ever would become exposed as a trust that would be such a crisis for that for that position that thinks it isn't trusting in anything whereas it, it must necessarily trust in something that that's my oh that's my, my goodness that is a, like a way better paper on crypto than I wrote uh, that is exactly what I was getting at. Uh, because so like in, in an answer to you right like ultimately there has to be a moment of trust that like oh i mean you don't have to wait for quantum they've all failed like except bitcoin and somehow tether 
which is like, but like, so in other words, we don't have to wait for that because a number of them fit. Like, so I am with you, like, th but I'm, what I'm working at, at the level is, is what is the fantasy of the articulated, wh what is wished for, right? What is wished for is a non-trust relationship, which is an interesting thing to wish for, right? So, right? And so I'm, uh, as I said to you, I think it, it obviously there has to be because at the very moment, like it's, it's acting as if like the buyer is somehow like, it has to be brought you have to be brought on board right you have to be sold the crypto um but the, but your crypto friends will certainly no trust is involved like it's out it's all there it's transparent you know exactly how many crypto tokens are out there you can count them and then it turns out oh but all the money is in you know in alameda right uh which is the, the FTX company right and so you're exactly right and so the way you articulated i gotta get the, the recording this we can just copy that right into our yeah good uh so then uh well i mean i can copy that into my book but with the way you put it is like we have a choice between a trust that acknowledges itself as a trust and then i like the way you put that it's the second one which is the trust that doesn't that's exactly the fraud right doesn't acknowledge that it needs it and it's particularly pernicious because and i like the what you said is you didn't make it like individual like oh i'm setting out the fraud to be a fraud but it doesn't recognize the trust that's required and that that's the problem with crypto is that people do believe in it. Like I don't I'm, it's I'm not here to Say that again. It's utterly self-unaware. Utterly. Have you ever talked to these people? <laughs> They're <laughs> utterly self-unaware. I mean to say out loud, like, no, no, I this this uh it's not pegged to the US dollar. I mean, the government the currency that's been around for 250 years, I can't well, actually 150, I can't trust, but I can trust this bozo in the Bahamas. Yeah. Okay. Um I think we're going to have to end it there. Um, join me in thanking Peter Grant. Thank you.